Today we're going to have again a follow-up discussions with Siddharth Roy, who is in Bali, on what's happening in G20. Siddharth, lots of things I'm sure that you are hearing, but to follow up on the earlier conversations we have had, we now have this whole question of a missile attack in Poland and the argument that it is a Russian-made missile. Now, as we all know, the S-300 is common to both Poland, it's common to Ukraine, it's common to Russia. And Ukraine has made a lot of missiles earlier for because it was a part of Russia, Soviet Union. So is, is it that the, the any, is there any traction to this claim that Russia has attacked Poland? Uh, it just isn't flying, uh, to be honest, uh, to be quite forthright about it. This claim that this was a Russian-launched missile that landed in a Polish village is just not flying. Uh, it is not what you just mentioned, that uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, make the same uh, missiles and um, material uh, that the Russians do is, uh, is, is well-known everywhere, well-documented, well-known. And uh, secondly, uh, the very reactions from the G20 leaders is uh, worth noting here. Uh, none other than uh, Erdogan in his press conference today at the G20 in clear words said, I don't see any Russian involvement in this. Now, he is not an outsider who is uh, uh, an, an, an outsider in any sense. He's not in India. He's not uh, uh, the BRICS nations, nothing like that. He is literally a member of the NATO, and he has simply refused to entertain this uh, theory. Not only that, his presser actually got a little heated. I'm not sure that will actually be shown anywhere, but he uh, uh, quite in, in, in a very sharp rebuke, uh, uh, you know, uh, chastised this uh, American uh, uh, journalist for asking bogus and leading questions. The sense that has quite clearly come out at this time is that uh, Zelensky and uh, his ilk, they are literally trying to sell something which no one wants to buy. And the misinformation, the sheer volume of misin misinformation, note how we spoke about this uh, since the very beginning of G20, whether it was the claim of a horde of missile attacks happening during the G20, that's not materialized. Uh, the claim that uh, Putin was going to be assassinated and that's why he didn't come, no confirmation of that. Lavrov was ill and hospitalized, no real confirmation of that. I have gone out and asked which hospital was it and there was no response. So claim after claim after claim ju is just falling flat. Secondly, uh, we saw that right after the news came out, uh, allegedly speaking, uh, Confidentially, uh, intel operatives from the U.S. government have told AP, their own agency, that there is no substance to this claim. We know how these leaks of the U.S. government and military uh, intel uh, setup work, really. So it is quite clear that uh, nobody is buying that theory. Nobody is willing to, and I repeat, uh, start a war that the world doesn't need and the U.S. taxpayers cannot afford. It's interesting, President Biden also has seems to have endorsed that this does not appear to be a Russian attack. And the AP report that you talked about says that, in fact, they have quoted three uh, independent sources saying the trajectory is, makes it clear that it was an anti-missile launch probably from Ukraine to stop Russian missiles that landed in a Polish border village. This is the scenario. Eminently believable, because if Russia has to hit, why should it hit a Polish village on the border of Ukraine if it had to hit Poland at all? Absolutely. So that, that sort of makes sense. And a Polish village is not, or the border, is not anywhere near any target that Russia would, uh, Russia would actually choose. So on both these counts, even President Biden has come out saying, no, we don't want a war on this. It doesn't seem to be an attack on Poland. I think that's something which is welcome, uh, probably as a co in the context that Zelensky would like to ratchet up this and see whether he can create 
a little more of uh, war hysteria around Ukraine. So it seems to be that game plan for the Americans was isolate Russia, but not to go to a war with, uh, with Russia immediately, or probably not at all. Just make them pariahs, international, you know, isolate them completely. <coughs> that seems to be their attempt. But what you are saying is that even that's not working. Absolutely not. I, and, and as far as the war is concerned, uh, probably what's the next step? I mean, what is the next obvious step that Zelensky is asking for? Draw in Poland into the war? Like start the next World War Three? Nobody is ready for that. Absolutely nobody with half a brain, no matter what uh, degree of a hawk or a warmonger they are, nobody wants to start a global war between really, really armed to the teeth nuclear powers. So Zelensky is really rather lonely at this moment in his attempt to like relentlessly ratchet up war hysteria. But the larger agenda, isolate Russia still stays. And that's very much visible, both in G20 and the United Nations. That it? is very much there, yes. And in fact, you see, uh, this is something like, um, uh, this, is, this is exactly a case of uh, the American establishment, especially the Democratic Party, uh, they let loose this uh, neo mccarthyite Russophobic uh, uh, information warfare in 2016. <clears throat> in it, <clears throat> initially, they used it for uh, shaming Trump, hiding the uh, massive electoral failure of Clinton, and they succeeded to a large extent. This has been a gift uh, for the Democratic Party, which just went on giving and giving, and then it easily extended itself first into the Syrian uh, standoffs and the Syrian wars, and then for the Ukrainian phenomenon. But now the problem is that the, the Russophobic uh, stance that anything claimed against Russia can be passed off as reported, verified news, anything which is even meekly a questioning of that, let alone defense of Russia. I mean, Nobody is going there to defend Russia, but let al even if we were to so as to so much as to claim that there are discontinuities in your in the story that Russia is culpable for all the possible ev evils of uh, uh, the USA, uh, they would uh, such a person or an outlet would be branded a traitor. Now, what has happened is that since this was such a fabulous psychop, such a fabulous information warfare tool that it kept on rolling and rolling. But now it's kind of a reductio ad absurdum that you cannot, under any sense of rational structure of thinking, uh, go on with this narrative. So what's happening now is that a section of the American powers, a section of the Western powers is trying to tame a beast which they have let loose. And here I would like to mention again how uh, the CIA just conducted a very high-level meeting with the FSB and said it in as many words in the press. I mean, they didn't need to really say it uh, if it was of no consequence. This is a return to the time when, if we all recall, uh, there was disagreement inside the Pentagon itself about going to war. And it was only the Democratic Party establishment-led uh, corporate media uh, sections, which completely poo-pooed that uh, cautionary word and went ahead with unbridled uh, Russophobic uh, agenda. And that's just coming home to roost now. Yeah, I think the things that I think you also talked about your interaction with the American press uh, in the briefing regarding what the Americans believe and what uh, other parts of the world seem to hold. It's also clear that most of the world is not a part of the U.S. sanctions, U.S.-led sanctions, which the European Union is and Japan are quite tamely following. President Biden said, ruble will become rubble. These are his exact words. Now, that has not happened. Russia is very much more than just a supplier of gas and oil. It's a much bigger economy than that. And so all of this means that the idea that Russia will crumble with the financial sanctions, if we refuse to buy their oil and gas, their economy will not be able to support itself. 
all that has also fallen flat. And I think that is what the rest of the world is seeing. We need Russian energy. We need Russian metals. We need food and fertilizers. Russia is a supplier of all of this around the world. Countries need this, including India, including Africa. And I think those are the voices which are now coming out quite strongly. So uh, it is entirely impossible for uh, the U.S. to survive without ample supplies of oil and gas. And in trying to isolate Russia, they, un they, they probably underestimated the intelligence and the instinct of self-preservation or patriotism of the OPEC+. Plus. If, if this is the kind of mess that you are going to hand out to one of the largest energy suppliers of the world, what they did with their uh, anti-Russia stance, what stops you, them from doing it against any of the OPEC plus nations? What is the interaction that you had with the uh, US spokesperson? And what do you think the US really is trying to tell the world, irrespective of what the reality might be? So my interaction with the uh, US spokesperson, Zed Tarar, it was evident in that too, that he couldn't really negate uh, my question, my very pointed question. And I asked him that if you are all right, with disarming and stepping back vis-a-vis -vis China or any other uh, ongoing or looming war, why do you have a different standard with Russia? And uh, he really did not have an answer. I mean, the video is up uh, for everyone to see. He tried hemming and hawing. That, in fact, is not because he doesn't know the answer. That's because he's not allowed to give that answer out. Much like what I was mentioning about Obama or any of the other powers, you know, the voices that be. Yes, the reality is that they have a public line and you cannot deviate from that public line very much, irrespective of what the reality is. But it doesn't seem, whether it's the G20 or in the United Nations, that their attempts to really isolate Russia completely is succeeding. Yes, people don't war, want war. Nobody is actually in favor of the Ukraine war. But what is the settlement going to be and how that settlement is going to be reached is certainly not going to be reached on Zelensky's terms or on NATO's terms. That is clear. What terms it will be reached at is something to be worked out as a part of negotiations. Today is 60 years again of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And right, it absolutely. is... And in the missile crisis, the resolution, today is actually when the Cuban missile crisis ends, that the resolution, as we know now, was that nuclear weapons will be pulled out by Russians, Soviet Union from Cuba, and the Americans would pull out the nuclear weapons from Turkey. It was still something which gave uh, enough to both sides, and Cuba will not be invaded again. This was the basic arrangement. Of course, at the time, people did not know about the Turkey part. That was not made public. It took a long time for that to become public. But the reality is that was a compromise. And what Zelensky is arguing, that Russia should surrender to NATO, and that's unlikely to happen. This is the reality of the war today. And I think what you're telling us about G20 also reflects this reality. Uh, Siddharth. Last question to you. Uh, since G20 is coming to a close, do you think the future of G20 uh, is something to promise because India is going to be the next president? I think it's a mixed bag, Prabir, uh, that uh, we have seen that there is a sentiment uh, from the G7 which is, which, which is kind of giving up on the G20 as being a forum where they have enough influence. So the, we might actually see sabotage or criticism or, the, or simply the downgrading of the importance and significance of the G20. But within that uh, lies uh, the very opportunity for the G20 to actually uh, get free of its uh, colonialist past or, or the G7 hegemonic past. What if tomorrow, with, given that India is taking the presidency over and China is backing the African Union to come in and it gets a much bigger stage while uh, pet programs of the G7 don't find enough uh, traction. So maybe we will be able to actually rebuild something out of the uh, broken or less than effective G20 in the coming year. 
And let's not forget that alongside the main G20, several bilateral and trilateral talks have happened between the member nations. So maybe the G20 will have to compete with the agreements and commitments of those to stay relevant and uh, stay effective. Yes, we have the break, the Shanghai cooperation. There are many other platforms which are international and which are not dominated by the G7. So, yes, thanks, Siddharth, for being with us, leading us to the current G20. Let's have a look at what finally happens in G20 when the final communique, if any, comes out. And what will happen in the future is, of course, open to a variety of events in which there will be a different set of players who will play. With Lula becoming the president of Brazil, Brazil might also assert itself in G20. Thank you very much and uh, for being with us and spending this time explaining the various contours of G20 and the contortions as well. <clears throat> this is all the time we have today for NewsClick. <clears throat> do keep watching NewsClick and do have a look at our international coverage.